In this course, we'll be reading literary texts, mostly novels, originally written in French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Romanian, and Catalan during the 20th and 21st centuries. Some are by authors you may have heard of, Marcel Proust, for instance, or Carlos Fuentes. Others are more obscure. But one thing they have in common is that each of these books, one way or another, has been judged noteworthy or influential. That does not mean you'll always enjoy them, but they'll be worth reading. Each text provides food for thought and analysis, and so helps us meet this course's first and minimal goal, to engage with a series of interesting and challenging texts, devise strategies to read them well, and expand our horizons through this exploration of new texts, new readings. If we achieve nothing else, I'll be happy, and you should be too. A second and more ambitious goal is to seek patterns of commonality and difference between our readings. What, if anything, binds these particular texts together? What concerns do they share? Alternatively, what makes each one different and distinct? Can we see tendencies or changes over time, or according to the various historical, geographical, social contexts in which they were written? Some commonalities are given in the choice of set texts, and these choices may be either arbitrary or determined. Why begin with modernism, for instance? Or why treat these books in chronological order? Well, you have to begin somewhere, and modernism is as good a place as any. Modernism is also a point of inflection, at which authors and artists and others become interested in new ways in the status of representation and the means by which we view or interact with the worlds we inhabit. And while I do not by any means propose a strict linear timeline of influence or innovation, and these lectures can be read or viewed in any order, it seems to me a fair assumption that everything that follows that modernist moment responds or reacts to it in some way. Equally, the fact that all these texts are all novels or novellas, prose fiction, is an arbitrary choice that I have made so that we can compare them better. We could be reading poetry or drama. I've simply decided it's more coherent to stick to one genre. These texts are also all more or less self-consciously literary. We're not reading journalism or historical or sociological analysis. This is a more difficult but less arbitrary decision. We'll have much more to say about the status and role of literature as we get down to reading. But for the moment, I'll suggest that picking literary texts highlights issues of language and representation. Literature, let this be a preliminary definition, is a form of writing that forces us to pay particular attention to how language works and the mechanisms of representation. Some of the differences between the texts are also given in our initial selection. I've sought a rough balance in terms of gender, geography, period, and language. We're reading books written by both men and women, from the Old World, Europe, Africa, and the New, the Americas, from almost every decade in the 20th century, plus two in the 21st, and in all the major Romance languages, including Romanian and Catalan. We may ask if these are significant differences, whether there is a real distinction between women's writing and writing by men, for instance, or between literature in French and literature in Spanish, as we go along. Our selection could have been more diverse. There's only one text from Africa and nothing from Asia, for example. I've not particularly attended to questions of sexuality, and race is perhaps but a minor theme. But I put it to you that it's a pretty good mix. Let us focus on the most significant principle of selection, the one that enables and constrains everything else. All these texts are presented under the rubric of Romance Studies. This is, most obviously, a linguistic category. Though we're reading these books in English, none of them were written originally in that language, or in, say, German, Japanese, or Quechua. Each was first written in a language that derives from Latin, the official language of the Roman Empire, hence Romance, and later the, ecclesi and later the ecclesiastical and intellectual lingua franca in much of pre-modern and early modern Europe. 
The question is whether this classification is arbitrary or significant. Do these texts have anything in common, simply thanks to the fact that they share, to a greater or lesser extent, some common linguistic heritage? Are they different, in any coherent way, from texts written in other languages? What, in short, if anything, is distinctive and different about Romance Studies? Responding to this difficult question is the third and most fundamental of this course's goals. We may well fail to achieve it, which is fine, but this is the challenge we are set. Here's an easy question. Most of the questions I'll be asking in this course have no right answer. You may always come up with some wrong ones. Not this one. Where is the romance world? Pause the video and write down your thoughts. While you do that, I'll have a can of Inca Cola, but I'll be right back. Where is the Romance world? You might come up with an answer such as Western Europe, in homage to the direct influence of the Roman Empire. Or you may suggest something like, wherever a Romance language is or was once spoken. A response that might envisage Madagascar or Quebec, Uruguay or Equatorial Guinea, Gore or Sao Paulo, perhaps even Somalia, or the Swiss canton of Ticino, as part of an expanded Romance world. Either way, however, you will be wrong. The only correct answer to this question is, I don't know. There is no romance world, and that is a good thing too. I'm not merely noting that the romance world is a fiction. Every geographical or cultural area, every continent or nation is a fiction of some sort. In the worlds of cultural historian Benedict Anderson, entities such as France or Canada Argentina or the United States, Singapore, or Eritrea, or even, say, Latin America or the Levant, are all fictions, imagined communities. No, the difference is that nobody has bothered imagining a romance world. It scarcely rises to the level of fiction. You can test this easily enough by going to your nearest travel agent and trying to buy a ticket to the ro romance world. They will happily enough sell you passage to Italy, South Asia or the Caribbean. Contested and dubious entities, though these all are. But the request for a flight or a ferry or a train to the romance world would lead only to the befuddlement. Moreover, if by strange fortune you happen to run into a time-travelling tra travel agent, though he or she might be able to arrange you to be sent to ancient Greece or the Inca Empire, it's unclear why they would send you in the past in search of the not even mythical beast that is the Romance world. Some 13th century feudal crusader state? I doubt it. But this precisely is the glory of Romance studies. It is the first characteristic that makes it different and distinct. It is tied to no territory. It is de-territorialized. Indeed, if we look to the travails of traditional literary disciplines, English, for instance, or French or Spanish. It is clear how much they remain hobbled by their lingering ties to territory, or even worse, to specific nation-states. Nationalism lingers in any discipline that shares its name with a nation. Area studies, Latin Americanism, for instance, or Asian studies, are likewise bedeviled by their efforts to speak for, from, and to specific parts of the globe, or in the case of so-called world literature, the globe itself, whose cultural or political distinctiveness they seek to shore up, yet eternally are forced to question, whose borders they anxiously patrol as they both shrink and expand. Roman studies has no such hindrances. It would be retrograde indeed to try to invent a romance world to impart some fiction of belonging. Romance studies belongs nowhere, and it therefore finds a place everywhere, Casting off notions of belonging or homeland enables a democratic freedom of expression and critique. Nobody can speak for Romance Studies or can claim somehow to be closer to its source. 
Here we're all strangers, and have a stranger's prerogatives to interrupt, to question, and to begin anew. The only thing worse than attempting to impose a romance world upon the globe would be a misplaced familialism, to speak of linguistic cousins or the like. But this is foiled with the realisation that the other thing that the romance languages share is miscegenation rather than heritage. They are Latin's unwanted and uncontrolled spawn, the product of counter-empire, the consequence of imperial decadence and decay. What do Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, as well as Romanian, Catalan, and so on have in common? They're all offshoots of Latin. But the thing about Romance studies is that here we study everything but Latin. In other words, if it is Latin that is to be the project's point of coherence, then this is an absent center, foreclosed from the outset. It is more productive, and more to the point, to observe that what these languages really have in common is that they are not Latin that they are mutants that have diverged from any source, escaped from any orbit, sufficiently to gain their own names and identities. What unites them is this divergence, the way in which each traces an erratic line of flight away from Latin to become something new, something different, something no longer recognizable in the terms of its supposed progenitor. The Romance languages are Latin's bastard offspring, forged in the encounter with the barbarian hordes that destroyed Rome and its so-called civilization. It is not tradition that they share, but their betrayal of that tradition. They are not founded on the classics. They are what usurped the classics and illegitimately took their place. Romance studies emerges when tradition is infiltrated and overthrown by the demotic, by the everyday speech of a nameless multitude. If Romance studies has no homeland, no territory to call its own, equally it has no paterfamilias, no father figures, other than those it constitutively turns against and betrays. All this is quite different from most disciplines, policed as they are by calls to origins and founding fathers. Romance studies, by contrast, starts from nothing, from destitution, but is open to the outside, to the edge of empire and what lies beyond. Nobody can claim authority here, because this is a mongrel anti-discipline that is born at the point that authority is overthrown, filiation denied, and the decision is made instead to construct something new, to become other. We add a further measure of betrayal by reading everything in translation. It's appropriate that Romance studies should be a project conducted in a non-Romance language to ensure yet another displacement or absent centre. Translation, with its inevitable perfidy, traduttore, traditore, as well as reluctant homage, is a good image for what we're up to. Remaking language, taking texts out of context, helping them travel and become new. It is also of a piece with the democratising tendency of what we're out to invent. Here there are no native speakers, no native informants. Nobody speaks Romance, but we all effortlessly speak not Latin. We have equal standing in this deracinated discourse that belongs to none and to all. How does all this square with what we'll be doing as this course unfolds? On one level little, and it's quite possible that we will never again utter the phrase Romance Studies until we are over and done. That would again be quite fitting in the spirit of what I am outlining as a primal betrayal. The point is not to get hung up on the rubric or the bureaucratic niceties. The project is to read, to think, to come up with new concepts, to open up horizons. This is what we will be doing week by week, rather than worrying too much about whether we are following the programme with sufficient fidelity. Why follow a programme when we could be more creatively be inventing ways to escape it? On the other hand, these concepts of betrayal and escape, miscegenation and becoming, translation and misunderstanding, error and doubt, are at the core of many of the texts we are studying. These often concern memory and recollection, infidelity and the invention of new forms of community. Whether it is Proust, meditating on his narrator's distance from a not-so-idyllic past and a place he calls Combray, 
Alberto Moravia's anti oedipal non-Bildungsroman Agostino, Joseph Sobel's semi-autobiographical account of the dog days of empire in Martinique, Clarice Lispector's description of a becoming animal in a Brazilian servant's quarters, or Carlos Fuentes' tale of an American drawn to death and love in the Mexican Revolution. All these authors and texts pursue an anti-tradition of pushing at limits, questioning the past, and fleeing to construct something new. They make us think differently about issues of representation and power, writing in the real, authority and authorship. In the end, we may not mention romance studies again, but it may turn out that, despite ourselves, it is what we've been doing all along.